I'm Maria Valera. I'm the manager of uh, the Voyeur team, PDIS Learning. Thank you so much, guys, for, for being here and support Ben and his uh, Lunch and Learn. This is Ben uh, Dugud. He's a, a tech star over in the research team, right? So, and he, he's here today um, to talk about the evolution of data, data fetching, graphic UI. So, I hope everybody enjoy, and we have some people over in the WowX too. So. If you guys have any questions over in the WebEx, please feel free to type them uh, on the chat, and then we'll be monitoring that to make sure that they get they get answered as well. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Ben. Awesome. All Thank you. you. All right. Let's talk about GraphQL. That's their the official logo. I grabbed it. Um, the evolution of data fetching. So, the origin story. So GraphQL was made by Facebook, and around 2011, Facebook decided to make their mobile app. Um, so this brought a bunch of challenges. Facebook traditionally was web-centric, everything was web, so you give a bunch of web developers and say, hey, go build a mobile app. It's a little different, different way of doing things. So they came from this web-centric background. Um, at first, their, their mobile app was just a web view that hit HTML, and so they were still doing web development, but just with a mobile view. So mobile was an afterthought at first, and then they realized, okay, the iPhone's not going away, Android is here, we need to switch to mobile first. So this, this really changes the way that developers think about things. You, in the web, you have this URL HTML centric philosophy or a paradigm of coding. And when you switch over to native applications, you have model views and like things are different. Like API versioning is now a thing. We're in the web. You just deploy a new version. Everybody gets the new code. They just hit slash API. If your API has changed, well then the page just changes. And so it just continues to work. But in the web, or in mobile, you can't, there are ways you can force people to update, but typically, you don't force people to update their apps. So you end up having to support a bunch of different versions of your application at once, and when you change the backend APIs, you often have to change the server endpoints, and that gets a mess. And if you look at Facebook, currently, I think they have like 2,000 versions of all of their different applications in production that they support at one time, which if you went to a versioning, slash API slash V1, that would, every two weeks they release something new. That would just completely blow up out of control. Um, and yeah, so around that same time, the newsfeed algorithm just started to really grow in complexity. Um, so what is the solution? So this is a quote from Lee Byron, one of the guys who made React. When we built Facebook's mobile applications, we needed a data fetching API power, uh, yeah, powerful enough to describe all of Facebook it's simple and easy to learn, so product developers can focus on building things quickly. They, with GraphQL in production right now, uh, they serve 260 billion requests served daily. This is web scale. Um, so, URLs, REST, and SQL, and the way we store things is not the way, as product developers, we think about our model, or we think about our data. Um, joining tables, primary, secondary keys, resource URLs, we don't necessarily think like that at all times. So how do we think? We think in terms of graphs. We think in terms of objects, properties, and relationships. We think in terms of the models that we use in our apps. So very often, if, yeah, almost all the time, you have these nested structures in apps where you have like posts, and posts have authors, posts are an author, posts also have comments. Comments have, have authors. <laughs> and like, it's this nested tree structure. It's not a flat, um, thing like that we would get from REST. So graphical. So I've talked about kind of intro to, to GraphQL. So let's talk about what it is real quick. So if you've, there's a Star Wars API, which is awesome. And yeah, swappy.co slash API, and, and it's a REST API. Somebody built this, and it's cool. But somebody built a GraphQL wrapper around this, these REST endpoints. So let's do some queries. So I can simply come here and type query. And this, this is GraphQL on the left. And those real results will be on the right. So I don't know anything about the Star Wars API. How do I know what to put in this query? There's a couple ways. I can do alt space or control space, and I get auto completions. And how that's done, I'll get to later. Um, but there's another way. There's this little docs tab here. And I can come over here, and we can click on root, and we can see all of the, these are the root queries we can make. So again, this is a graph. So in order to get into the graph, you have to hit a root, and from the root, you can then grab all of the pieces that you want from the graph. 
So let's, let's mess around with films. So film takes a film ID, and I can click into that and read all of this info, this documentation. So what does a film return? OK, it returns these things. Let's, I don't like, reading isn't always fun. Let's just make some queries. So let's just grab the first film ID. And then I can't get everything all at once. You have to specify exactly what you want. So come down here, autocomplete. Let's get the title. And we have no red line, so this should work. I can command enter. And there we go. So it returned JSON data um, with a film, which is the film that matches the ID one, and New Hope. OK, it's pretty interesting. What else can we get? We can get the director, George Lucas. Um, let's find some planets. Where's the planet one? Oops. What can we get in planets? Bunch of population. We can get all this random fun Star Wars data, the surface water of every planet. And so you, you notice here, this is a nested like, object. If I were to use REST for this example, I would make one request to film, looking up at the film ID, pass it that ID, and it would return me all of the data about film. I mean, you can see this over here. They were returning you know, all of the things. So, but I don't, I don't really want all of the data. I just want title, and I just want the director. And then within that, every film has planets that are in each film. So, and for every planet in here, we can ask for these properties here. So I'm going to ask for the name, the population, the surface water, and it returns me that. And I can get, you know, I can get all the other things. I want the, the gravity. Oops. And it gives me that in this nested structure. And this is how we often think about data. In REST, I would have to make one request for the film, and then for each planet, so that the film request would give me an array of either URLs, an array of like planet IDs, and then I would have to make a request for each ID in a kind of pure or formal REST, whatever you want to call it, um, way. But this is just one HTTP request. There's no magic that this graphical, the editor, is doing. It's one HTTP request for all of the data in exactly the format we want, um, which is pretty cool. So hopping back over here, graphical is awesome. Um, so what is GraphQL? It's a data query language for client applications. It defines a data shape. It's strongly typed. Um, and it's a protocol. It's not, it's not a server language. QL stands for query language. It has nothing to do with SQL directly. Um, it's introspective. So going back to the example, I could see the docs and everything. And that wasn't anything extra you had to really necessarily build. That is hitting the, actually I can show that. That is hitting the uh, GraphQL itself. So GraphQL has this like underscore schema. And I can do things like get all these, this information about it. So I can dynamically build the documentation that you see here on the right just by hitting the GraphQL endpoint. And there's nothing as a developer you have to do extra to enable this, which is super cool. Um, Yes, so real world rest. So in a mobile context, like showed before, I just wanted the title and the director of the film. That's all the information, whatever section of the view I'm building. If I were to use formal rest, that would give me all of the data. Well, in a, in a mobile context where data latency is large, people are using you know, 3G, 4G data, you don't want them to use more than they have to, and it's going to take longer, overfetching becomes a problem. There's also underfetching can be a problem, where you obviously need all of the data. And if you underfetch, things just start failing. Um, so I mentioned multiple requests. For that same example, I'd make one request for the film and then n requests for however many planets it had. GraphQL does it in one request, which again, going to mobile, like latency is huge compared to desktop. Um, and multiple requests are just simply not an option or cause a lot of problems. So the other thing is, let, so let's say, OK. We need, we need film with planets. Why don't we just make a, a custom endpoint that's, OK, let me get slash films like underscore with planets. And that would work. You could then return all the data you wanted until you're doing that in every view. And then all of a sudden, you have 1,000 server endpoints that are all custom, which aren't necessarily bad. But then you get into the versioning issue. OK, I bump a version, and I change some of the models. So now I have to bump the version for every API. 
but now I have to support two apps. So we have to support version one and version two of a thousand custom endpoints, but then two weeks later I ship another release. That's version one, two, and three for a thousand endpoints each. Like that just blows up really quickly. So REST often grows into not pure or not formal REST. Um, REST isn't a spec. You could get five different answers if you ask five different people what REST is, which is interesting. Um, so here's kind of a, a back end or a, a good model. So here we have REST on the left, or yeah, on the left, um, where the client will make uh, direct API calls to either like a microservice or a specific API endpoint, which then fetches the data it needs from the various um, data stores and then returns those. Pretty straightforward. But if you look at GraphQL, GraphQL provides one endpoint, slash GraphQL or slash whatever you want to call it. And then the GraphQL kind of server will sit on top of the different microservices or different endpoints and fetch all of the data that way. And so you get this really clean from the client's perspective um, way of thinking about things. And uh, David Nolan, the author of Ohm, coined this domain-driven architecture where the client gets to decide and make requests to the data that it wants. You have a question? Uh, question. So you mentioned like uh, multiple requests uh, happening from the client in this particular scenario. Um, it seems like though in the GraphQL uh, side of it, it's still making multiple requests. It's just buffered by a gateway of some sorts, right? Is it like client to server? Yeah. It's one client to server and then server to server. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that, that makes sense. But I guess my question is like, does GraphQL do any kind of local caching of data to optimize so you don't have to make those, those round trips? Um, from client to GraphQL server to actual endpoint and back? Yeah, so the question was, uh, I guess, kind of twofold. That GraphQL makes a single request from the client to the server, so this, this top piece, but then on the server side, it, it can and often does make multiple requests to different microservices or things like that. So it's, it's one request from the client's perspective, but yeah, behind the scenes there are more requests, which is typically way faster and like, yeah. They're usually co-located. They're usually co-located, exactly. Yeah, so the latency is way different of an issue. Um, and then the second question you asked was caching. So how, do, how would caching work? And you, you could do this in a number of places. Facebook has a, another library, Relay, which will actually cache on the client. So let's say you ask for data that you already have, it just simply won't ask for that. So that's, that's caching on the client still. And then... Um, data loader. Do what? Data loader. Yeah, data loader. I'll get into that. Um, but yes, caching is cool. I have an example of that later that I'll show. Um, and it's pretty, like, GraphQL is backend agnostic. It doesn't like SQL, Mongo, S3. It doesn't really matter. Um, so you could easily implement your own kind of caching layer in between there. Or on so it's, it's backend agnostic. Does that mean that it's communicating directly with the, with the database? No, backend agnostic in the sense that, like, GraphQL doesn't have to be written like the core GraphQL right here, your GraphQL server, could be written in JavaScript, could be written in, there, I have a list at the end, a bunch of different languages, .NET. Um, but the, I know, we'll get to examples, but the queries that it makes, it, again, it can just make HTTP requests to microservices. Gotcha. So what your microservice is written in, GraphQL doesn't necessarily care about. Gotcha. Make, did I answer all your questions? Sweet. Thanks. So, domain-driven architecture. Pretty cool term. Um, so GraphQL core principles. It's a power men powerful mental model, model for developers. Like again, we think in terms of graph, we think in terms of the model. When we go then try and fetch data, why do we have to context switch and think about, oh, how do my resources look like? Or how do I join these tables on the back end? Or how is this stored in the database? Like as a front end client developer, you don't necessarily want to think about those things. Um, I mean, maybe you do, but it's easier not to. So it's a type system and I'll get to how that ties everything together soon. Um, composition. So we saw that a film can ask for multiple planets per film. We have this really slick way of composing things. Um, it's backed by arbitrary code, which I talked about. Your microservices or whatever your actual main server is written in can be written however you want. Um, example all the things. So here's some example queries. The hello world of GraphQL. If I don't specify query on the front here, if it's just like uh, braces, then it's assumed to be a query. So I left those out here. There are queries and mutations if you want to actually mutate the data. We'll get to that later. But what do you think this returns? It's going to return JSON object of me with my name. Pretty straightforward. So 
you can parameterize things. You can, which you saw earlier, you can pass in an ID and you just define these almost functions on the back end um, that specify the arguments. You can make them required or not required, and then they can return data accordingly. Um, so let's look at something a little more complicated. You can make, so I mean, I could have my parameters inside of, you know, profile picture and then request things based on that. So I pass it a size and then it returns me back the height and width of a different size with a link to the URL for whatever my profile picture is in this example. Um, you can alias things. So in this I have me and I have little pick, which is just the profile pick of size 50. And I also want a big pick, which is size 300 and for whatever the model is. Um, and that's going to return it in, again, a very simple, it's almost like if you just added semicolons and then inserted the values is how the JSON looks that gets returned to you, which is really cool because you know, as a front end developer, you don't have to think about, oh, does this, the JSON will look exactly like the query, essentially. And you've seen this already, but nesting. Um, so I can ask for me, and then I can ask for the, and this is like a Facebook example, I can ask for all of my friends and their names. And that would give me me, my name, and then an array of friends, and then a bunch of objects that are just my names. And this is my team, if you're curious. Um, more nesting. I can nest as much as I want. So I could ask for me, my name, my, my, an array of my friends, and for each one of them I want my name, and for each, each one of my friends I also want an array of all the events and the types of the arrays of that event. So it looks like this, and it flows off the screen, but you can see I get an array of friends, and then for each friend I get their name, and then the types of all of the events that they're attending in this simple example. And this is a super powerful model. So fragments. So say you end up using the same thing, like the, the little pick, big pick. You had the width, height, um, and URL in there. We could have used fragments. If we use something all the time, I can use friend fragment here, where I define the fragment. And that's going to be exactly the same as the last query, where we define our fragment down there, which is just, OK, it's a name and an array of events. Each one has a name. Um, so yeah, query variables. So just lets you kind of parameterize things a little differently. Um, and in graphical, which is an editor, you can insert query variables down here, which just looks like JSON. Um, so yeah, oops, come back over here. So you just defined, okay, I define a variable name and then I, I give it a type. And an exclamation point in GraphQL just means it's required. So in this case, I would have to, when I make this get few posts query, I have to provide um, a query variable. And if I don't, it'll throw an error. So that lets us do all these crazy things like this. So this is like a complicated query where I have, okay, I want myself, I want my name, I want a little pick and a big pick, and I'm using a fragment there. Um, and I can get my friends, and I can order my friends by importance. And I can ask for, okay, I only want the first n amount. And in my query, friend count is optional, and it's defaulted to five. So you can do all these you know, slick function-like things that we're used to doing all from your queries. And then I can have my query variables down here, or which would appear somewhere else in the application, depending on the client that you're using. Um, but yeah, mutations. So we haven't talked about mutations yet. But essentially, from GraphQL's perspective, it's just a function. I pass it an ID and a name. And I'm passing it to the change name mutation. And so behind the scenes, it can do whatever it wants. But in this example, it's going to fetch my user based on the ID. It's going to replace name with whatever I pass it. And then it's going to return a person. And so it returns back a person. So this second part. Um, is querying based on the type it returns. So I only want the name, the email, and the ID from whatever it returned. Um, and you notice here, like, I could have put commas for name, comma, email, comma, ID, but they're optional, so you don't have to. So GraphQL, the server side. So to me, the first time I saw GraphQL, I'm like, this is amazing on the client. This is like the only way I ever want to fetch data ever again. And the server must be super complicated. Like, there's no way they get away with this without it being crazy, because this is, this is too easy. So real quick, what does the server not do? It does not mandate a specific language backend. And it has nothing to do with a storage engine. It's not SQL. Um, it's not Mongo. It's nothing like that. So what does it do? It's an application server that conforms to the GraphQL spec. So again, going back to the whole REST is not a spec thing, GraphQL is a spec. So when Facebook open sourced this, they released it 
as a spec, um, which allowed them to, you know, anybody can go write a GraphQL conforming server in whatever language you want. So there's, there's GraphQL servers for uh, JavaScript, .NET, C Sharp, which is the same, uh, Java, Lua. There's even one written directly on top of PostgreSQL, which is interesting, but I have a list at the end because um, there's a bunch of them. But because it's a spec, even if it's not in your favorite language, you can read the spec and implement it yourself. Um, and that is, again, not what REST does. REST is like, you ask 10 people what REST is and get 10 different answers. Um, so this is really cool. GraphQL exposes a single endpoint. For queries, mutations, they're all going to be sent to the same thing, and then GraphQL is going to parse it and figure out what to do with it. Um, the endpoint, yeah, parses and executes the query. The query executes over a given type system, which you define. Um, and the type system is available to clients via this slick introspection thing that they do. And that's what allows us to have this inline documentation within the, the graphical editor. Um, so the server structure, you have your core, and this is where you implement it per language. You have your type definitions, and then your application code behind the scenes. Um, so the type system. This is essentially an API for the different types that you have. Uh, it serves as a thin mapping layer that maps application logic to GraphQL via the type domain. So it serves as this, this thing, that this application server that sits in between either your microservices um, or if you just have one server that's a REST server, it sits in between that and the client um, and allows you to just really specify the whole graph, the whole domain that your application has via types. Um, and it does this via introspection which is the GraphQL API for querying types. Um, you can have metadata, so the docs come from like the docs tab. Uh, you can specify inline documentation when you define your types, which makes things super easy to maintain. You can also deprecate things, so if things are going to get deprecated in a future release, you can add, I think it's is deprecated um, to a given type, and so if you're a front-end developer, you say, okay, that's going to be deprecated soon, I should use something else instead. Um, and this is all like in line where you define the type. So maintainability is through the roof. Um, so you, you, again, this co-locates the documentation with the mapping, which is just defined as your types. Um, validation. So you can at runtime, or I guess at compile time or build time, you can tell if any of your client queries are valid based on the app schema. So if you're, like you know, we saw here in the Star Wars API one, if I try and query for uh, winning, which is not a field, I'm going to get a red underline, and it says, cannot query field winning on type, because that's not a thing. Um, so, and you can get that at compile time. You can insert that into your build step in your code, and it'll like lint your code, essentially, and check if, hey, you're making this query that's impossible. Um, so that's cool. Example all the things, round two. So. Hello world. So this is kind of getting into the server side. So again, this let's this should be super complicated, but it's really not. So what do we do? First, we define a schema. So we say new GraphQL schema, and we give it a root query type. And that root query type maps to um, all of these things here. So if you think of Facebook, maybe a, a friend with an ID is a root query type. And once you have that, you can then get friends of friends, or friends of friends, their events, and you can get access to the entire graph, but you have to start at a certain place, um, which is what the root query type is for. So we have this root query type. What is that? Oops, wrong way. So root query type here is a new GraphQL object, and we give it a name, um, which in this case is just query. We give it a description, and this is what's going to get inserted right into the doc. So this inline description, oops, I don't need that one anymore. This inline description is going to be right up here. And they didn't give theirs one, but off. Where's an interesting one? Where's a film? So a film is a single film. And again, like this is kind of a straightforward example. But whatever the description is, so say you have something complicated, you can just simply add a string right there, and your docu documentation is there. Which if you go ahead and change the structure of this type or this root query, it's super easy to see, hey, my description's out of date. You know, you're co-locating the documentation with the mapping. OK, so fields. So each field in this object that we're returning, so I'm returning an object that has a property me, that me is going to be what we could query. 
Um, so, me. We give it a type. So me returns a person type. And we'll, the definition for a person type is, is coming. But that's like giving it the return type. So then I can make queries based on person type. Um, we give it a description again for the docs. And then there's this resolve function. And this resolve function, this is where the magic happens. Because it passes it um, R, like a root, args, and context. And we can do different things like that. So let's say we, pass in this, we can pass in like this, the session into the context. And so for this, then I can return fetch person, which is some API we have, um, the, content, the current user ID of whoever's logged in. And fetch person returns a promise in JavaScript. And GraphQL is intelligent and can figure out, OK, if it's a promise, then whenever that promise resolves, that's what we return. If you're confused, more examples are coming. Things should start to make sense. So what's a person? Um, a person has a name, a description, and then it has a field, which is a name and an ID. So a name is a GraphQL string. So basically, a name is a string. We can give it an optional description for the docs if we want. And it also has an ID, which in this case is a string. Um, OK. So let's talk about resolve a little bit more. So I have this person type somewhere in my GraphQL schema, which has a name, person, and a description. This is a person. So it has this fields. Um, and each field is just like a property. So I could get like person.name, person.profile pick. Um, let's look at name. So we, again, we give it a return type. We say name is a string. We give it a description. And then for whatever reason, let's say in our database, we store first name and last name separately. So once, once the object is fetched out of the database, I want name to map to first name plus last name. So I simply just return person.firstname plus person.lastname. And this first argument of resolve is the current, um, the current object like of the type that we're at. So we're on person type, so the first parameter is a person. Um, so continuing, so I can return, basically I can return a value directly or I can turn a promise which is what profile pick does. So profile pick is a string because it's just going to give us a CDN URL of the picture. Um, but then we take that person and we pass that person ID and we fetch to some microservice or some place and that returns us the URL we want. You had a question? I mean, as, <clears throat> as you present this, I mean, I'm thinking that, yeah, you, I see you're resolving to different REST endpoints mm -hmm. um, for each property in your object. But what if 10 of them were the same endpoint? Is it sort of aggregate that into a single call and then map out the result properties onto your properties? Or is it like 10 calls? Uh, so, and I didn't do it here, but I could, uh, I can define an overall resolve for a person type. Okay. Uh, and that would be where I would make, OK, person maps to this endpoint. And then whenever I make that request, it, that's how it knows, going back up here, person.firstname, person.lastname, it gets that, that person object from the, the like outermost resolve of my type. So you do the, you kind of work your, you design the optimizations and take yourself how you make the choice of definition? Kind of. There's another thing going back to uh, the whole like caching. So like let's say, I don't want to give away the punchline. It's coming. The answer is coming. Um, somebody have another question or no? OK. I had a quick one. Yeah. When you say promise, is that type safe for anything like that, or is it just as the developer, I know that that's going to return a profile pick URL string or whatever. Like, is there anything? I guess so. What do you mean by promise? Is, is there anything like compiler wise if there is a compiler involved in that? Um, that provides any kind of check or anything like that? Or is it, is it smart at all? Or is it just you have to basically code that other end to return what you're expecting? So, yeah, if you, you kind of have to know that fetch returns a promise. And you know what promises in JavaScript are, or is that the confusion? That's also, yeah, OK. Really promises is just a way of handling asynchronous operations in JavaScript. So essentially, it's a, you receive an object that you can um, kind of like pause on. And it's a, it's a promise saying that it will be resolved, or it will be rejected, and it'll throw an error. So if you, if you inserted some other thing that didn't return a promise, it would return you weird errors. Be like, OK. So, so the promise does, though, have basically some kind of, uh, it, it's like what the fields would be that it would return. Yes. So it would be a promise to, in this case, to a string, which is a, the CDN URL. Okay. So, so yeah. after it makes that HTTP request, it'll then resolve the promise and return the string that is the URL. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah.
Okay, were you going to say something, Daniel? Well, yeah, I was going to say, you probably would be good to briefly set this is all how you would do it in Node.js. Yes. Right? Yes, this is Node.js examples. Um, in Java, the equivalent of a promise is a future. In C Sharp, the equivalent is a task. So you probably have some kind of similar mechanism if you're trying to implement a graph as well. Apply for each of those implementations. Yeah, this is, this is Node specific. Um, but yeah, and you could do things like you could use TypeScript here or Flow to actually add the typing if you wanted to be more like runtime sure that this method returned a promise and then it would do that for you. Um, or I should say compile time, not runtime. But so all that to say that resolve can return a value directly or it can return a promise to a value. Um, so mutations on the server, what does that look like? So first, so how do we make this request? I want to send create a person and I want to give it a name. I'm going to give it ultimate. And then from that uh, corresponding mutation, when I get that person back, all I want is the name and the ID, which is what this next part is. It's called like a subquery. Um, okay, so first we go back to our GraphQL schema, and this time we have to add a second field for the root mutations, and we define a mutation. Um, root query type is the same as before. Person type is the same. We just have a name and an ID, and then here's the mutation. So first we give it a name and a description, which is like normal, and we give it a field, which returns uh, an object, and each field on the object is a mutation. So in this example, we have create post. Create post is another mutation. If we wanted to add a second mu mutation, we would just add another um, object property at the same level in this like JSON tree. Um, we give it a type. So this returns a person. And we can specify arguments. So going back real quick, to here, we have this argument. We wanted to pass it a name. So when you create a person, we want it to come with a name. Um, so args. And I'm GraphQL non-null means it's not nullable, which means it's required. If you pass me, if you just say create person with no name, I can't do anything with that. It'll reject you right here, because it is required. And then in the documentation, you would see a little exclamation point um, when you viewed like that parameter. Question. Yes. And there you have create post. The other one down below, I think, is create person. I'm assuming that for, to get this to work, they have to have the same. Yes. Name. That's a typo. Good catch. Okay. This should be create person. Right. My bad. No, you're good. You're good. Um, so resolve. So again, mutations have resolves, and this is where the magic happens. This is it's literally just a function, which um, takes in args and it takes in the context again. And I'm just logging the name just for sanity to kind of show that this is just a simple function. And then I just return an HTTP post to API slash person. Like if we're assuming rest, I'm posting to a person endpoint and I'm, the body is just going to contain that name object. Um, and then afterwards I'm just resolving with the data it returns and then this data is the person object that it was created which gets returned to the query and then we get this again. So this works. Does that make sense? Question. So what is the typical approach for if you go back uh, to when you showed the HTTP post call? What is the typical approach for placing the address of the actual data store? Is it just that you put it in, or is this actually running? Because you talked about how the Gravit SQL application server makes requests to the data store. So what is the approach taken to put in the address of the data store? Okay, so because this is just a function, um, in this case, I'm assuming that there's some already some REST style endpoint, and I'm just posting directly to it. And I'm assuming that is what actually hits the data storage, and that REST service that's already there is going to create everything, and then after it's done, return me the JSON object, and that's what I'm returning from GraphQL. So GraphQL is kind of just acting as like a router, and it's relaying requests to where they need to go. Right, but I'm saying is that the, graph, that's, that the GraphQL process is running on different machines from the data stores, correct? Yes. So what is the typical way of actually getting, you know, putting the addresses in for that? Is there a configuration that you set up when you initialize the service, or? I mean, and you could do it however you want. I, I guess you're right. This probably doesn't make sense to be slash API, but right here I could just do HTTP colon slash slash my service slash API slash person. Um, and you could abstract that out into a config file if you wanted. Um, but at the end of the day, they're functions. So if you know either by inlining a string or some config variable, you can specify that kind of however you want. But the 
that that could be like a, a SQL connection and make, you know, pass in a SQL query instead of an API type. Yeah, and you could. Because this is just a function, if I, if, like, this makes sense if you're, if you're not starting from scratch. You already have a REST service, so I'm going to do this. But if you don't have a REST service, you're spinning up something from new, you can return, like if you are using Mongoose or some data adapter that uses uh, like promises, or even in, in the then of the promise or in the callback, you can return. Um, and where was I going? It'll, it'll work. So if you're spinning up a new service, you can hit the database directly if you want. Because at the end of the day, it's still just a function. There was a question in the back, or? I was just going to make a comment that um, it, in the end, the spec is agnostic to how you're retrieving the data. It's just putting this layer of kind of self-documenting code around it all. Exactly. So it's just, just a layer of Yeah, GraphQL is going to say, OK, you wanted this, this person type. Or you wanted to make the mutation. OK, so we get here, and then we pass you the args and all of the info you need. And then from here, you GraphQL doesn't know how to do it. You just specify how you want to actually change the data. Um, and then if you, if your return matches the person type that you expect, everything will just work. Any other questions? Or? The, um, yeah, I'm just thinking in terms of view models and transformations, automapper style, um, is that a common expectation here? Like, or are you expected to work with the schema as defined and the nesting as defined, et cetera? Or is it, you know, if you had four levels of nesting and your client ready to prefer everything in, in a flat object, is that, some, is that sort of implicitly considered? Um, That's a good question. Um, you could specify the type, so let, if you want it a flat object, you could make a flat object type and then hand that off to the GraphQL server and for each field in that type could have its own resolve and then that can fetch all of the data and GraphQL can intelligently like uh, or at least the JavaScript version, I imagine they all do, but can intelligently parallelize them all. Right. And so it just waits till all of the requests then resolve. And once they're all resolved, we'll return to the client. And, and one more thing, is, is it, I mean, a lot of this is read um, path. Is it kind of also, um, you know, the binding assumes the right path as well? Like the, um, is it, I mean, is this, does this definition hold for both directions? Um, I mean, you have to define, like, here we're defining mutation, and if I go back here, you have to explicitly define the query, which would be kind of the read model, right. and then the mutations, which are what you expose to, to kind of write. So here, this, this example is not super great, because it doesn't have the, the mutation side, So because you, you can't really, like, mutate the Star Wars API, it's just there. Um, but right here, you would have your root mutations um, would appear under this, and when you click into it, those are all of the root mutations or root functions that your API, that GraphQL exposes. Does that make sense? Um, so you can, so like, in your, in your mutation, I can say, going back up here, I can, or here, I can say that, okay, this args, this just requires a string. But let's say I want to create, um, I want to create a person. And I want, I want a whole person object. So I could say, OK, this args is going to be a person, and its type is person, person type. If you've already defined that, um, it should just work. Now, you may want to have a difference, because you can't create a person with, like a person has an ID, but your input person doesn't have an ID. So you could make an input person type, which would contain everything except for an ID. Um, but there's different ways of doing that. But it is kind of. You, you can have symmetrical models, depending on how you, you structure it. Um, and I can show you more examples in the code, because we're using this on the, in the project we're working on um, for the research team. But you can, most things work symmetrically as far as the type system. You would expect a person type, I want an input type as a person, and a return type as a person. Should work. It gets a little hairy when you're like, create a new person, but without an ID but like it has an ID. So that's kind of where minor differences can happen. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Do you guys have? Yeah, well, I or, have two questions actually. Okay. One, does, it, does GraphQL or any of the libraries that are offered um, have any built-in scalability uh, features or is it all up to the person hosting the app servers to scale out or the they need to? 
Yeah, it's up to you. It's just, so in this example, this is just running on a node server. But since it's just making simple, in, in this example, it's making RESTful calls to a RESTful service, you could very easily horizontally scale um, all of your node GraphQL servers, and then they could hit you know, a scaled layer of your REST service, and then if you just had a load balancer at the top, load balancing. Built-in communication though between the GraphQL servers, it's all up to you then. Yeah, GraphQL sits as this kind of intermediary layer where you define this types that kind of map your underlying API to the client and can then efficiently bundle the requests. So it's, it's, it's stateless, so you don't need to talk to other GraphQL servers. Yeah. Yeah, I just want I wanted to know if it had anything built in or any. The, the, the second thing is does it integrate uh, or have any are there any I guess other libraries that maybe integrate with Swagger and kind of generate this for you? Or do you have to always define these schemas if you wanted to just oh. kind of build it based on like an aggregate of all your microservices? Yeah, so there's there's a really slick um, library called Graffiti which right now works with I think Postgre um, and Mongoose if you're using like Mongoose schemas and if you just plug in your Mongoose schema it'll just essentially generate these types for you or generate this this kind of ORM layer for you. Um, those are the only two I know of. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody built one for Swagger but I haven't personally looked at that. So it seems like you've taken the versioning pressure off your microservices but now you've got you know, your create person is under those 2000 versions of you know, your clients. Mm -hmm. How do you handle having that centralized uh, GraphQL gateway, whatever, um, dealing with all that? So yeah, it can get weird if you decide to um, to remove fields. Theoretically, if you never removed fields, then you're just always backwards compatible, because your old versions. Okay, the old version requests the name, right? As long as I don't ever remove the name, then it'll continue to work. And again, Facebook does this, and if you, the guy was saying, if you pull out your iPhone 3GS, figure out a way to power it on, it'll still work with Facebook because, because of GraphQL. They have one schema with like 3,000 entities, um, and it still works. And it grows, um, but they're, so they're, the other side of the coin is, so they're assuming you never remove things, which maybe you want to do. You can do interesting things, so you can have this like is deprecated flag, and you can leave it there, mark it deprecated, um, and then you can build, you could build tooling. I, I imagine Facebook probably has this, um, where again, you can tell at compile time or at build time whether your queries are valid. So you could easily write a system that says, okay, whenever nobody's using this deprecated field anymore, like our, our two year supported like 2,000 versions of all our apps finally roll over, and we've wanted to deprecate this field, okay, none of them are hitting it, so now we can deprecate it. And then it's safe to remove. Um, so that's probably the way that you would want to do that if you were Facebook. Does that answer? Okay. All right, so I have a question, and then this goes more about the permission levels. So let's say you have your application that has multiple different roles, and yeah. um, you don't want to exactly expose all the capabilities of the GraphQL servers on the endpoint side, the person query. Uh, how would you go about like pretty much uh, determining like what a person can access, would that be done exactly at the schema level or would you create multiple schemas? Uh, you do that at the schema example and nice segue. So we have this, <laughs> this GraphQL context. Um, and so here I go, this is, I'm gonna set it up kind of at the like node server level. So we're gonna use express and I'm gonna grab express session. And so express session is where, and you could do this with kind of however you wanna do it, but that's what's going to contain like the current user ID or like the user ID, you can then fetch the roles, so on and so forth. Um, and then Express GraphQL is like that GraphQL middleware and then we have our schema. So we create our app, um, we tell it to use session, pass it some secret, stuff happens behind the scenes. And then we say, okay, use GraphQL and I pass it in the schema here and I'm in dev mode so I want graphical set to true, which gives us that you know nice, super cool, uh, GUI. Um, and then here we get the context. We pass it an object and we say, okay, the session is going to equal expresses request.session. And so from there, in any of the queries, you have this context object. So going down, we tell it, uh, yeah, schema, GraphQL, context. We tell it to listen on port 80. And then somewhere else in our schema, we have this. So we have this sensitive string. We only want to reveal the sensitive string to certain things. Um, so in our resolve function, we say, okay, if 
the context.session is logged in. So let's say we only want to show it if you're logged in. If you are logged in, return source.sensitive string. Otherwise, just return null. So, I mean, permissions are like roles. You can handle the same way here. Okay, if context.session.roles is like an admin role, then okay, return the sensitive string. Otherwise, return null. Does that answer your question? Kind of makes sense? So you use this context. So we're actually using the context to do like file uploading as well. But you can pass in like anything off the request or really anything into context and then Basically, if it is allowed, just return it. Otherwise, return null. Um, yeah, which is a little different paradigm before, because like in, in a REST style, like I can't even hit certain endpoints unless I'm logged in, unless I'm authenticated. This would still let me hit it, but it won't actually receive the data. You could still handle that on the REST side, though, if you wanted, right? Like if you wanted the REST to handle authentication, you just kind of like pass it through from the GraphQL. Yeah, you could take the uh, like. Let's say your your session has cookies. You could take that cookie and just pass it into the HTTP call and then return that. Um, and then if it, yeah, that's how, yeah, that would work. Any other questions? I know the, okay. So, demo time. So, this is like my favorite GIF ever. Uh, uh, all right, so we have an endpoint, we have a rest. So, I guess kind of the other thing is like, people are like, oh, like there's, I have to completely buy in to GraphQL in order to start using it. And I would completely argue, as I've showed in the examples, that that's totally false. You could write in a GraphQL API on top of your REST or your pre existing endpoint structure, and it'll work. So, in this example, um, I have this. Let me make it bigger. Can I make it bigger? It's got your resolution on the laptop. Yeah. I don't know how to make Postman bigger. But. I'm going to request localhost slash API slash persons, and I'm going to give it an ID of one. And that is going to give me this. So I have a first name, last name, email, uh, an underscore ID, or an ID, uh, and then friends. And friends is going to give me an array of URLs for, for each one of my friends. Um, come over here. And this is just where the server's running, so I'm logging every get request. And you'll see why that's awesome later. So. Close the, don't save. I don't remember what I did. All right, so we have this folder. And uh, so I've already installed some packages so you don't have to watch me download the internet. Um, but I have Express, Express GraphQL, GraphQL, um, and that's pretty much it. So Axios is going to let me do HTTP requests and we'll get to data loader in a minute. So in my index.js, uh, um, Let's, let's grab Express. Let's grab Express GraphQL. Um, I think let's grab our schema. So we're going to pull from our local file and Nothing in this in this yet, so we'll make that happen in a minute. Um, and from there, I will initialize. Do what? Good catch. That would have been bad. Um, <laughs> that would have been funny. I will probably make mistakes, so not perfect. So we have Express, and let's listen on port 5000. No, oh, let's not pass it a callback. It'll just work. Um, OK, so I want to use at the slash GraphQL endpoint, I want to use GraphQL. And I think it's a function which takes an object, schema, and graphical set to true. Right? OK. So now let's define a schema. So let's import some things. And I'm using object destructuring, which if you don't know, I can explain. Please ask me. Um, GraphQL. So I can grab, let's grab object type first. So I can say, OK, um, const schema equals new. 
new GraphQL schema, and I think takes an object of query. Yeah, we'll pass query. So let's grab that. GraphQL schema, okay. What's a query? Okay, so in this case, if we look back here, uh, we have a person. And a person has all these fields, so we kind of got to define each of these fields. So we have, um, and we don't really care about underscore ID in this case. Um, we have first name, last name, email, ID, and friends. Um, and for simplicity, since I've already done this, try not to cheat, I'm going to copy this here. So we have a person type here, which I realized I need to put at the top. And I'm going to grab these other things. So we've got GraphQL string and GraphQL list. And I think that's it. List, and is there a non-null? No, there's not. Let's, uh, I've got this thing down here. So we need a function get person by URL. which will take in a URL. And we will just say, OK, we'll do that in a minute. So in the query, we are going to say, um, this is our root query. So we got to give it a name. And I do not remember what I called it. So we'll copy paste it. And I can't copy paste. So, so our query we're going to pass to the schema. And this is just a shorthand for that, if you haven't seen it. Um, we're going to give that query a name. And this is our root query. And we are going to expose a root person field, which is type person type. And it's going to take in args. Um, so queries can take arguments of a non-nullable, which means a required string. Um, and I did not grab that yet. Non-null. Sweet. OK, so and then we're going to resolve, and we're going to say, OK. So whenever I, this is kind of what I was talking about before. Whenever I get an overall person, I want to resolve that by calling this, this function. I'm just going to return whatever that returns um, with this API. So I'm going to pass the ID of the argument directly to that. OK, so let's make this function. So I define it up here. Um, so Axios is a simple oops, uh, library that will let me do HTTP requests. And so right here, I can return Axios dot, uh, in this case, a get request, a get of the URL. And then in the case of Axios, it's going to give me a response. And I want to return response.data, because that's where it actually is. And I think, I think it's data of 0, because um, it returns me an array for some reason. So OK, I think this works. So to kind of reiterate, let's hop back into index. So we define an Express app. We use the graphical or GraphQL endpoint using the GraphQL middleware. We give it a schema, which comes from the other file we just wrote. We say, OK, GraphQL or graphical, there's an I in here, so many puns. Um, graphical set to true, and then listen on 5,000. OK, and the schema, so, and I do need to do this. Exports equals schema. So we export this GraphQL schema, which contains a root query, which we define here. So we say, OK, the name is query. The description is root query. And then the only field it has is person. Person returns a person type, which we defined up here. Um, it takes an argument of an ID, which is a required string. And then we resolve that by passing in or by calling this function, which sends a get request. Um, to our URL, and then returns the data. So person type has a first name, which is a string, 
And then right here, there's a resolve function here. So it, we passes, it passes us the person. And if you notice, our schema, first underscore name. JavaScript, that's like not typically the way you write variables. But that's the way our, our endpoint exposes it. But I want to expose it as first name, no underscore. I can simply map person.firstName with an underscore to person.firstName camel cased. And I do the same thing with last name here. So we have first name, last name, email, which is a string, ID, and then friends. And so this is where it gets cool. So a person has a friends. Friends is a type, GraphQL list, of persons. So persons have an array of friends, which are person types. OK, and so for the resolve, so for each list of those persons, for each friends object, I'm just going to say, OK, persons.friends.map get person by URL. And if you don't know what map does, essentially it just calls this get person by URL for every um, element in the array of friends. And if we look back here, friends is an array of URLs. So for each one of those URLs, we're going to call this function and we're going to get the data, right? So assuming no mistakes, this is somewhere else. OK. Uh, npm start. So it's working. So if I come to Chrome, and I go localhost 5000, we get cannot get. <sighs> Classic. Did I do 5000? Yeah, the slash GraphQL. Thank you. What am I doing? All right, there we go, it worked. So if I hop over to the docs, OK, we have this root query. And I define the overall query. Root query is person, which takes a string ID, which is required. Actually, I can actually zoom in here. String, which is required, denoted by this, and returns a person. OK, this is a person. And I get all these cool fields. So friends returns an array of persons. All right, so let's see. Autocomplete all the things. So for each person, let's say for this example, Oops, I want a person ID of one, and which is a string, and I just want the first name. And this is actually the wrong URL. Is it? Oh, yes, this is. So up here. I already have this REST server running at localhost elite. And right here, we can just say uh, uh, base URL followed by the URL passed in, right? And that should work. Uh, the URL has a slash down here. Yeah, and all these have slashes, so that should work. Okay, let's just refresh the page. And there we go, it worked. So the reason it worked is you see this, this query string it puts up there? That's actually how GraphQL parses this. So it takes all of this, URL encodes it, and that's the actual message that it parses. Um, and you could do this in the post. Graph graphical just does it in the, in the URL, which means you can also export queries kind of cleanly. Um, but this gave me what I wanted. First name of Ben. And one, one HTTP request from the client. So I want my last name too, email, and ID. OK. Now I want friends. And it's going to tell me, OK, fields friends of type person must have a subselection. I can't ask for everything. But I can do this. And I want, OK, I just want the first name of all my friends. OK, so I'm friends with Chris, Joseph, and Kaysen, and I can get that there. I want last name, too. OK, so that's pretty cool. Now, what I can also do is get my friends of friends. And I can get their first names and last names. All right, friends has, each friend has a friends array, and so on and so forth. And you might be thinking, if we look over here, 
this is a bunch of requests. And look, I'm getting Ben do good, Ben do good, Ben do good. And I'm going to request for that every time. That's, that's inefficient, especially when with GraphQL I could write queries like this. You know what, I'm just going to copy paste this. OK, so each friends has friends. I can do this as much as I want. And it took a while, and there we go, friends of friends of friends of friends. And that just was a lot of requests, right? In the database, there's, there's only four people. I shouldn't need to make 100 requests for four people. All right, so this is what a uh, couple people had asked questions about. Like, this is just inefficient. So Facebook has this NPM package called Data Loader, which is a read-through cache, um, and will essentially like bundle them all into efficient requests. So there's only four people total. I should only need four requests. So what does that look like? Um, so here we go. I import data loader. Everything else should be the same. I import data loader. I bring this base URL out and this get person by URL out into this index. Um, I create an app. Let me make this bigger. Um, I use GraphQL HTTP. And here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it a little different syntax. I'm going to take the request object. Um, and this lets me specify the context. So I create a loader. And a loader is going to be a person, which is subtype person loader, which I'm creating right above it. Um, and this data loader takes an array of keys and is basically going to return uh, efficiently the promise of mapping all of them by URL. So it's a little weird. And if you're interested more, I'd recommend looking at the data loader API itself. But essentially, I pass it into the context loaders. And then in our schema, um, down here at the overall resolve, I say, OK, this is the context. And I'm uh, destructuring. So I could have done context. And then here, context.loaders.person.load. I give it the, API, or the, the URL. And then I do the same thing here. Loaders, except I'm going to call load many, since this is going to be a list. Um, and I pass in the URL. And I think this, it's actually, I think it's broken. <laughs> it's broken because for whatever reason, Babel decided to stop liking the imports. Let's try it, though. Let's see if it works. And it failed because of the import. So I can fix this really quick. I have no idea why this worked. It worked on my other computer. Classic. Works on my machine. Should be using Docker. Um, I'm down here, I gotta say. And if you're curious, the import export syntax is not um, supported in Node 6 yet, but it's coming. I fixed the other one before this started, so my apologies. And that good catch, pair programming. Consware? Okay. Um, so, OK, it should be started. So, which is actually confusing. Oh, the other one's not running. So, I can go to localhost 5000 now. Refresh the page. Refresh, yeah, L is nothing. So, I can do person. Um, can I just undo? Nope, can't get it back. OK. Person, we're going to start with ID1 which is me, and that has to be a string. First name, what is that? Can't Friends. Hmm? Can't what people are looking. I know. OK. And so for each one of these, we want friends, first name, last name. 
stop trying to autocomplete. I can just let's just keep doing this. Hit prettify, bam, it looks pretty. Boom. And these are there from earlier. Let's try that one more time. Four requests. So data loader, so this kind of goes back to your whole idea of caching. Like data loader, it's like, okay, you just tried to request four of these a lot. I'm just going to do it once and then return it to you in a way that makes sense. Um, and this is something Facebook made. I'm sure there are other libraries that are similar and do similar things. But it's super slick and works. Does this, uh, the caching, does that work per request? Like if it notices you duplicated the same kind of data in, in one request, it'll batch those? Or does it? Uh, yeah, this one. Does it do this on the type? Where you define this right here, keys. It, it does it based on those keys. So in this case, the keys are the URL string. But if you would like pass in IDs or something like that, it, it basically just memoizes the. Uh, the keys don't persist. That's right. It's, it's just, just, yeah, it's per request. Request. just per yeah. Like if you were to hit it again, it would just make those same four requests. Like, right? I am pretty sure. And pretty much it does that on the machine. That's like the server side. So it doesn't do it on okay. the client side. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't do it on the client side, which leads us to there are there are like GraphQL clients like Relay. Mm -hmm. When Relay will cache these things for you. So in Relay side, if you like did a refresh or something, they will actually cache. Okay, you already made these four requests. We have the data in the cache. Don't do that again. And they're not even going to make the requests. Yeah, and that's on the client side. But this the, at the GraphQL side, yeah, this is kind of the most efficient. As far as users, let's say like for example, like the cache is really starting to like crush the CPU users. How like how long does the cache stay with the data loader usually? I don't know. I think it's per request. Or you mean on relay? No, on data loader. On data loader, I think it's per request. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And on relay, if my first request was for name, first name, and my next request was for friend, uh, will it just send the diff and get the like? Does it know? I am not sure. In free, in relays, like they they force you to like stricter paradigms to make the caching work, um, and they do like a lot of things on fragments. So I think if they say, okay, we already have the fragment for like a given data type, like don't return it again. Um, so I'm not sure. To be honest, I haven't gotten a chance to play with the relay yet. Um, yes. So it, it seems like um, when you're doing it this way, because you're trying to make your stuff dynamic and chainable in nature, yeah. that each resource essentially would be making its own kind of calls to get itself. Whereas if in a classical sense, if I was just having a standard REST API for my app, and I knew that I was going to be getting nested data, I would most likely design an endpoint that's doing a much more efficient, let's say, a SQL query, because we were doing MC. And I'm doing one query to get back all this stuff, even joins and whatever. But when I try to make things nice and consumable in a graphical manner, I'm now having to do nested queries and, and multiple queries. So is there an approach to optimizing? I know that the caching is fine, but I'm saying, like, even still, I had to make four requests to a backing server versus yeah. one. Yeah, so, so it, like, obviously having custom endpoints, which returns the data however I want directly from the database, would be faster. But then again, like, there are trade-offs with everything. And you get into the trade-off of, OK, how do I do versioning in a mobile sense? Like, Facebook originally built this for mobile. Because from the, client, from the, the mobile client's perspective, I wanted to make one request. And then the server can make n requests um, or whatever the server needs to return the data. Uh, but you get into a lot of weird issues like versioning. And so if I make custom endpoints, what if I change one of them? And if I change one of them, OK, I need an API slash version, typically. Because in a mobile sense, OK, like Facebook releases a new Facebook app every two weeks. And they would support each version for like a year, or a year or two, maybe it's two years. Um, and so for them, having custom endpoints for everything, well, obviously, like, that's much faster. That is optimal. Uh, it doesn't scale super well with supporting different, a lot of versions at once. Like, you can take out your iPhone 3GS, and Facebook still works because of the same GraphQL schema. Um, so there's that trade-off. Now, you very well could, in the resolve function, um, hit a custom endpoint. Like, if I go back to the one I did, uh, here we're, we're hitting this, this API here, this person's API. But 
let's say you wanted it nested and you already had that endpoint, you could query it right from there. It's like, um, you, you can do it conditionally, like would I do something like when I'm doing the root query for persons, I can check, hey, am I, am I also requesting friends? If so, use this endpoint. And if I'm not requesting friends, use this endpoint. Yeah, you totally could because, yeah, because at the end of the day, resolve is still just a function. So you can make whatever kind of request. If you have a special endpoint, you can do, you can introspect the query that gets sent because it gets sent and it gets parsed into an AST. And so you can say, okay, if this, a, like in your example, if this AST has a friends field, then yeah, then make the request. And so then we get one HTTP request that turns everything. But if it doesn't, yeah, just simply use the rest endpoint. And you totally could. Sorry to no, you're good. Um, so let's say I have a REST endpoint that gives me persons with their friends all together and it did it in a single query, right? But, and now that I did that, how would the next level know that I can use that, the friends that came from that initial resolve on my root query? Like how, how did the, the friends beneath the resolve this year? nested persons, yeah, how, how, would the, how would that get the data from? Um, I think you're... Well, so in this case, you might just do like a if person.friends, just return person.friends, otherwise map it to the get URL. I think the, get, the get by URL. So the bigger thing is that you're, you're trading for the ability to change the front end API, the front end. I was just trying to That kind of optimization, <laughs> obviously at Facebook and Netflix, Netflix uses Falcor. Yeah, Falcor. Um, you know, they, they're doing mass, mass amounts of queries. That's not really an issue for them. You know that level of optimizing at the database level because you're thinking about these queries that are going to specific. They're not being joined, so they're really, really fast. So you're you're, you're joining at some level, and there may be you know some slight optimization op issue there, but the benefits far outweigh that 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 last level optimization. Yeah, and like Daniil was about to say, I think if you already have person dot friends. Yeah, just return it. Just, just return nothing. Or just return person.friends. Uh, otherwise, return the map and get everything else. Um, yeah, so because that object will have whatever the object you know above it, like they pass the objects around in a way that makes sense. But yeah, again, like it depends on what your trade-offs are. If you need things super fast, you're in a super real-time thing, like maybe GraphQL is not the best answer. But I think a lot of times it is. And you don't have to have complete buy-in. So like, at the end of the day, if you wanted to hit your custom endpoint still, you don't have to hit GraphQL. But certain pieces of your app can. Like, it just, it's interoperable pretty easily. Um, so is there any more questions? In this case, is it possible, like, just because it's dealing with friends, you can make, uh, like, an API that returns, or that takes in multiple IDs and returns multiple people. So in that case, you could, no, basically, it, it can take in an array as, an argument, right? Yeah. And in that case, you could have all those friend requests just in one call instead of. Yeah. Three. Again, it depends on how your underlying API is structured. But yeah. Uh, well, speaking of joins, uh, so say you have two disparate, JP, uh, two disparate APIs, like two separate APIs, but they're related by ID or something like that. Is there any kind of syntax where you could say, hey, take whatever ID I'm passing in and now propagate that down to this other subquery? Or I guess. Do all the queries have to share a common root? Is the question. Do they have to share a common root? Uh, no. You can have like as many different roots. So, if yeah, if you wanted like friends, this example, there's only one query and it's like person. But let's say you wanted, yeah, friend. You wanted a root query friends, which returns you an array of friends. You could do that. Um, or again, in your resolve function, if you wanted to join, I could okay, make a request to friends. So now I have all of the IDs. Take those IDs, like make another request. Like you could do two requests oh, you could do that via and then join them yourself, yeah. But there's like nothing in the query language, language itself where you can say, I don't know, you have two separate resources, uh, people and employees, and you want to kind of give me all people that are also employees, something like that. Um, give me all people that are also employees. Uh, it depends on the way your API is structured. So yeah, GraphQL doesn't know that itself. Um, yeah. Okay. It would depend on the underlying API. So right here, you could say, okay, you could make a query. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this may be way too far off topic, but a little bit. But uh, have you compared GraphQL to Falcor and looked at some of the benefits? And you know, what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, Jafar Hussein gave like a super awesome talk at React Europe on GraphQL versus Falcor. And it boils down to um, GraphQL gives you this type system. Falcor has an optional type system. Falcor is more concerned with just querying raw JSON, where this is like kind of a DSL. You have to know the query language, although it's simple. Um, you can build super select tools on top of GraphQL, not as easily with Falcor because it's optionally, like you can apply a schema. Um, the biggest difference is Facebook has 3,000 entities, like 3,000 things you can get in their GraphQL schema. And Netflix has like 20. So for Netflix, like just keeping the entire model in my head, there's only 20 things. Like you have movies, movies have titles, ratings, like it's, it's pretty straightforward. And so he in this where, and he, I think he, I don't know if he made Falcor, but he talks about it all the time. Um, kind of gives like, that's one of the biggest trade-offs are like, okay, if your entities are small, there's 20, you know, Falcor just works. Um, but yeah, and if you want to link to that because it's an awesome talk, you can just Google uh, Jafar React Europe 2015, I think. Or I can give you the link, just ping me. Um, but yeah, any other questions? I only have a couple slides left, so. Sweet. So, nice, we did it. Um, so how are we using GraphQL on the research team? So this, what the, we're building a culture app right now, and it's CQRS, event sourcing, microservices. So we're using GraphQL as an API gateway, where all of your commands that you create are mutations, and all of your, your queries hit, the, relative, or hit the, the query microservices and get all the data they care about that way. Um, so GraphQL speaks to microservices, said those things already, um, and it documents and describes our API. Kylo approves. <laughs> um, so common questions, and I think we pretty much hit most of them. Authentication, versioning, safeguarding dangerous queries. You can do other things too, like be like, okay, if the AST, like if the, the length or depth of the AST is like over a certain amount, okay, you're doing something malicious, just stop. And you can just reject the query in essence. Return null. Um, so there's that type of things. And again, Facebook's using this in production um, and has been for a while. So GraphQL core, already exists for all these libraries. Um, and the, the SQL one is like, it's, I think there's already a wrapper around PostgreSQL, which is pretty cool. And these are links, which I'll give you the URL for my presentation. But uh, there's a couple other things. The GitHub repo, Facebook slash GraphQL, is the GraphQL spec. And then there's a GraphQL GitHub org. GraphQL JS is the reference JavaScript implementation that Facebook maintains. Um, GraphQL slash GraphICL. There's an I right there. Thanks. Um, is the GUI IDE, and then there are some other docs. There's a Slack chat for it. And awesome GraphQL has a bunch of links. Um, so there's some clients. I mentioned Relay. Lets you do a lot of things on the, the front end. Apollo is super cool, and it's kind of like front end agnostic is their goal. So Relay works for React, if you're using React. But Apollo is supposed to be fr uh, front end ag agnostic. So if you want to use Angular, or view or take your pick. Um, and then Loka is a really lightweight, just like uh, lets you do HTTP queries with GraphQL really nicely. Um, so you should GraphQL all the things. And yes, thank you very much. <laughs> is there any other questions anybody has? Or? Just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, when you said that GraphQL is uh, it prevented, I guess, over-serving or under-serving data. That's strictly on the client level, right? Because you're still sending all the data to the GraphQL server, and that's just filtering and passing. Yeah. Yeah, because, like, data is an issue on, like, a mobile client. You don't want to send more than you need. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. you just, you still have the load on the server side, just not client side. Yeah. Also, this presentation is available on my GitHub if you want it. Link's at the bottom. <laughs>